We gather here today on Treaty 1 territory as storytellers. We believe it's important to acknowledge the lands, the waters, and the people of Treaty 1 territory. The Broken Head Ojibwe, Saguin, Long Plain, Peguis, Rosa River Anishinaabe, Sandy Bay, and Swan Lake First Nations, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The water we drink comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation on Treaty 3 territory. We are committed to working together to protect the land we cherish and to forge a better and more equitable future where everyone can thrive. Hello, my name is Kim Wheeler. I'm the curator for The Bridge. This is the In Conversation with Rosanna Deerchild series. Over the next four days, your favorite cousin and my best friend is gonna bring you in-depth conversations with thinkers, doers, playwrights, artists, educators, and innovators. So pour yourself a cup of tea, get comfortable, prepare to laugh, think, and be challenged. This is In Conversation with Rosanna Deerchild. Dante Anin Buju, welcome to the Bridge of Festival of Ideas. This annual event invites audiences to engage deeper in the issues of our time. This year, we're looking at how art can be a catalyst for change and move the conversation forward towards reconciliation. We want to share this conversation with as many people as we can and ignite a sense of community around these ideas. Every event is free, so please invite your friends. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, your favorite cousin. Today we are in conversation with one of my favorite human beings of all time. Thompson Highway's journey began in a snowbank on a cold December night in 1951 on the border between Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Nunavut. Since then, it's been an epic odyssey for the son of a caribou hunter and world champion duck sled racer, Joe Highway, and artist, bead worker, and quilt maker, Pelagi Highway. He has taken his stories and music all the way to the international stage, becoming one of the most recognized and respected and beloved writers of our time. Thompson Highway has written countless plays, including multi-award winning The Red Sisters, Dry Lips, Autumn Moved, Capus Casing, and Rose, all part of what will ultimately be seven plays. He's also authored children's books, essays, a novel, music, cabarets, and even a Cree opera. And that's just the tip of the very large iceberg of a personality that is Thompson Highway. Hello, my friend, Tanse. Hello. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. By the way, so you I, have such I, a... I just want to say that my mom's name is Pelagi. Pelagi, I'm sorry. Pelagi Highway. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about how, how you grew up with these two extraordinary people? Uh, extraordinary is the word. Uh, so uh, we grew up in a nature, natural surrounding, uh, beautiful, beautiful lakes. Uh, have you ever been up to Reindeer Lake? You will be astonished. Uh, Reindeer Lake, uh, Rocher, my home reserve, is at the northern tip of Reindeer Lake, which is the 23rd largest lake in the world, is what, they say, is what I found mm -hmm. out uh, on, on Google. Uh, 255 kilometers long by about 65 kilometers wide. And it's got 5,000 islands, we can only imagine. And the water, it will be astonished if you ever see, which I hope you do someday. Uh, it's pure, pure, clear, crystal clear, clean water. It's just fantastic. And uh, islands, a lot of them surrounded by beautiful sand beaches. And nobody living there except, uh, except us. Like we'd have 30 lakes to ourselves, you know? Like, and my father was like the king of this, this kingdom, you know? This estate. And we were, so we grew up, like he was like the king of this estate. And so we grew up like princes, like royalty, royalty of the North. And that's what it that's what it felt like growing up there, uh, growing up up there. And I st and I still I still feel like that. I still feel like royalty. <laughs> the way I'm treated in my life today, I am I am so loved, uh, so loved, and, uh, and people have been so kind to me all my life that mm -hmm. uh, I, I I intend to live out the last of my year, the last of my life, uh, the the last years of my life, which hopefully won't be too soon. Uh, mm -hmm just as an act of thanks, just to thank people for all the love that they've given me, my teachers who've taught me extraordinary things, you know, and my friends and uh, just uh, an amazing, uh, it's been an amazing experience to uh, live to this age and just be so loved. I'm, I'm drowning in love. I think that's how I'm gonna die. I'm just gonna drown in love. Yep, there you go. So that's what it was like growing up there. I was like, we had, had, had the best marriage imaginable. I always say that my parents, Joe and Pelagi Highway, had the kind of marriage that they can only dream of. 
in Hollywood. They will never make enough money in Hollywood to be able to afford the kind of marriage that I come from. Mm. 60 years of love, love, and more love. The best marriage that ever was. And the most loving parents. And, uh, and the best part of it too is that, another part, good part of it too, is that when you have that many children, uh, people who have only two children or only one child, I don't know, I don't know about that. Uh, because the dynamic of having many children is that you make your, all your mistakes, you make your parenting, you make all your parenting skills with the first three or four. So that by the time you get to number 11 and 12, you have your parenting skills down to a fine art. And so me and my younger brother, Renee, were the last two of these 12. And we got the best. We got, first of all, they were great parents, but to be the, the, the last ones, uh, you know, uh, was their parenting skills were refined. Uh, it was, uh, there was never any uh, abuse. We never got hit, for instance. Uh, uh, so it was a you know, benefit uh, piled up on top of benefit and uh, and uh, it's just been a privilege every step of the way. Yep, that's mm. how I feel. I feel. The older I get, the more I realize what a spectacular childhood I had. Now, many people know you for your amazing writing, of course, but the first instrument, I, I suppose, that caught your heart was the piano. Yep. Do you remember the first time you played the piano? Uh, yes, I do. But uh, what happened, there's a lot of music in my family. Uh, there's Métis blood in my family. I'm mostly Cree, but there is some Métis blood in there. And we were very much affected by Métis fiddle music. My mm. grandfather, uh, his name was Joseph Harry. He's from Pelican Narrows and he's long gone. May he rest in peace. He was a legendary fiddler. My, and then my father uh, was a, uh, uh, well, he was a legendary accordion player, but he was a very good accordion player. And I became a pianist, uh, a piano player. I, I was a third generation musician in that family. And so I, was, I went to uh, a residential school near the Palm Manitoba. There was no pianos in Brochet, okay? Uh, no, nothing like that. And so I saw my first piano at Guy Hill and it was being played by a young woman from South Indian Lake called Marjorie Moose. <laughs> you might know her. That might be your aunt for all I know, eh? Probably. Yeah, anyway, yeah, she was wonderful. She was a wonderful pianist. And she uh, accompanied the choir. We were, we had no choice. We had to be in the choir, even if we didn't, we had terrible voices. I happened to have a very good voice when I was a child, but uh, it, when it, when it broke at age 11, I lost it. I, I have a dreadful, <laughs> I have a dreadful singing voice now. And, uh, but at the time I was very, but I'm very musical, so I can carry a tune. And so I was always, uh, the teacher always saw me, the choir director was, would always see me looking at Marjorie Moose while she was playing the piano and I'd forget to sing. You know, I was supposed to be singing in the choir, but I didn't because I, Marjorie Moose had all my attention. And I was jealous. Of I wanted to be like her. I wanted to be like Marjorie Moose when I grew up. And Marjorie said, <laughs> she might be listening to this, eh? And she's ready. She's just a lot of fun. And uh, she still is, at least at, uh, last time I saw her, which is quite a while back, but uh, in Lee Rapids, Manitoba. Anyway, uh, and she played really well. And I just was so jealous of her. I wanted to play like that. And so eventually the, t the choir director saw me uh, being distracted like this. And so she put me out of the choir and told the piano teacher, Marjorie's teacher, that maybe she should take me up as a student. And so this little, little old nun, Sister St. Tadama, we used to call her. That was her name, Sister St. Armand, but we call her Sister St. Tadama. She was, uh, we had our own version of English because we were, we were only Cree at the time. She picked me as a student finally, and I started taking lessons and I learned very quickly. And I, I uh, worked very hard. I've always been a very hard worker. My parents taught me how to work hard, uh, very, very disciplined. And so I learned very quickly and that's why I picked it up. And then we, they saw that I was, uh, that I had ability, the teachers there. And so they took me to the park 25 miles away to, in those days it was miles, uh, to get, take lessons for a professional piano teacher in the park. And it just went from there. I went to high school in Winnipeg and I got picked up by another teacher. And the teachers got better and better and better until I was finally on the cusp of a career as a concert pianist when I was 22, 23. Not mm -hmm. an international career, like a big career, but a small one, a nice small national one. And I could have been, I could have been, but I, I got sidetracked, but I'm still a very, uh, I can't speak, I can't blow my own horn because I don't play the horn, I play the piano. Uh, and the last time I tried to blow my own piano, I got very sore lips. <laughs> Dry lips. Anyway, uh, I like to very dry. Anyway, uh, but uh, I still can play very well, and I don't do classical music anymore because that's the, that's the route I followed was classical music, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, and all that stuff. So now I all of a sudden I discovered at a very late age that I was basically capable of writing music, 
and I had the chance to I have a music degree. And to get a music degree, you need to get all, you need to take all the forms of study, history, form, counterpoint, composition, even, even orchestral uh, writing, writing for a symphony orchestra. So theoretically, I had the chops to, write, to be able to write a symphony. I wouldn't though, because it takes way too much time. It takes a huge amount of work and who would play it? Eh? And uh, you need hundred musicians to play a symphony. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, did, I realized at a certain point in my career that I was capable of writing music and, uh, and, those music to, and that music turned into songs and, that, and those songs turned into cabarets. And now I perform cabarets as a pianist. I'm still a performing pianist in cabarets, in cabaret form with singers and saxophonists and musicians of this, you know, one kind or another, all over the world. Now I travel all over the world playing the piano today. And that's how it happened. Thompson, I, th I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn that you didn't actually um, have formal training as a playwright or formal training to run a theater or formal training to do this stuff. You just did it because it needed to be done and be just that was your creative voice that you found when you were building this and influencing this and shaping this and creating this space for indigenous uh, literature and stories. Did you know you were creating a movement or did you just take it one story, one play, one note at a time? One note at a time. We just, we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just, we were just doing it. You yes. know, we were out there to have fun. And, uh, and we did, we had a tremendous amount of fun. We were, we were, uh, we were piss poor. We were, we had no money. And uh, cause I, I, because nobody would fund this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So we ended up so we ended up funding it ourselves out of our own pockets. I lost. I lost my credit card. I only had one in those days. Lost that. I, I ended up. I ended up homeless. Actually, I lived in people's people's basements uh, in Toronto, and uh, they helped me out. Those friends. So I'm very grateful to them. But uh, you know, I have never been so poor in all my life. Back back then, I had. I, at that one point, I was. I was. I was reduced to only one servant, and I used to. And that was your around. boyfriend, or. <laughs> yeah, really. You no, know, I, I just, uh, yeah, you know, but my point is, I have never been so happy in all my life mm -hmm. to be penniless, but happiness, happiness, it was just, we were, it was so exciting. It was such a passionate period of our time, of our lives, so colorful, so risky, and so, uh, oh dear, the things we used to do, you don't even want to know. Like, you know, I used to run my own, I, like, I, I do everything. We had a show, for instance, okay? And uh, and I and I was the general manager and the artistic director and the piano player and the person who wrote the musical score for the play and wrote the play myself and sometimes I was in the play myself because we couldn't afford to hire actors or musicians right so I ended up doing everything myself which is how I learned started writing music and which is why how I learned suddenly that I had the capacity to write music and so and so I, t I take the box office money in the, in, the, in this little metal box. And then I'd put it under the piano bench. And then I'd run, run on stage to, to the back and uh, put the piano, uh, the cash box under the piano and play the piano for the show, that kind of stuff. And Sunday uh, night was, Sunday afternoon was the last show of the week, Sunday matinee. So normally we'd all go drinking uh, to, at the, our favorite bar in Toronto, which is Grossman's, which is still there on Spadina, Spadina and College. And uh, for those of you who know Toronto, and oh man, we had fun. But you know what? <laughs> we were so broke that I'd bring that cash, well, the cash box, I'd transfer the money to a large manila envelope and put it in my briefcase. And, uh, and, we'd, uh, and we'd pay, for, not, on, that, not that I'm encouraging people to do this, but I'd pay for the beer for the box office, <laughs> for the box office money. I mean, I keep track of it and return it eventually. But that's how, that's how we did it. Like if my pack sack was there and it paid for the, for the beer for like, what, six, seven people, right? Eh? And that's how we lived back then, high risk, and uh, and so much fun, so much fun. It was yeah. a very, very fun time, very fun time, and it still is. It still very much is. And one of these days, we're gonna have a great, great big party and uh, celebrate the movement, so to speak. Uh, we just have to find a city where we can do it, a central city. But mm -hmm. a lot of native actors out there now, lots of native writers out there, lots of native musicians, native filmmakers painters and oh my goodness if you got all those people together i mean our, our national poet now is a queer woman you know yeah louise half louise half uh, and right. uh she was a fantastic person and i just absolutely adore her and i said to my partner this morning my, my favorite i was naming off my favorite people not my favorite writers in terms of literary quality 
which of course there are many, but I was talking about my fear to the people who are closest to me, who most, who I, who most admire, whom I most admire for their personalities. And I don't wanna, I wanna make the list, but please don't feel insulted if you're not on the list, okay? But I was people like Louise Hatt, uh, <laughs> Merlin, Merlin Norman from Edmonton, the Métier Poet from Edmonton, and I think she's fantastic. Uh, Eden Robinson from Kinemat, BC. I, I, which is a very small place, eh? Uh, if you would be there, uh, it's a very small place, so I call it Itty Bitty Kitty Mat. Thank you. That's where it is from. And, uh, and then, uh, oh, Richard Van Camp from uh, up Yellowknife Way. He's been, I think he's in Vancouver now. I, I can't keep track of his movement. Sometimes he's in Edmonton, sometimes he's in Vancouver. He's, he's just a beautiful, beautiful person. Uh, who's another one? Oh, yeah, Gregory Schofield. Yes. Crazy Michi. I love him. You know, and people like that, just fantastic, great people out there. And it's so much fun to be with them, to hang out with them, to be, hold their hands, and they hold your hand too as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so to be part of that community is a, is a, it's a, a great blessing for me. Great blessing. And of you course, know what sounds <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, you've written since written some of the most unforgettable characters and stories uh, of our time, not just Indigenous storytelling, but Canadian storytelling, uh, world storytelling, the Red Sisters, Dry Lips, Rose. Um, and these are four, uh, there's supposed to be four more in this series of plays. Where are you with that? I have one already uh, sort of semi-written. Uh, the other ones I haven't started yet. But, uh, Part of it is you, you run into roadblocks, okay? Every step of it is a roadblock. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have to say yes. that we became so successful at one point that certain things started to happen uh, that were not totally pleasant. Uh, it, seems, it just seems to me that, uh, as they say, money is the root of all evil. <laughs> so people started making money and uh, see people started buying, you know, whatever, you know, things that can ruin your life, let's put it that way. And uh, people started becoming unhappy. There was, we had too much. And so, uh, uh, and then you lost shows, people's careers, some people's careers were destroyed. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> not that many, but some. And, uh, and people, and, and, one, and you learn at a certain point in time that one of the unfortunate uh, byproducts of uh, success is jealousy, whether you like it or not. Eh? And so people try to stop you. And uh, there are forces that, 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 that try to stop us because we were outshining them, you know, like we were doing better than a lot of, uh, well, our native, our non-native friends. You don't want to insult them because we, they're lovely people. And uh, we started to outshine people. And uh, some people didn't like that. And uh, anyway, there are forces working against us. So we went to brick walls and that's part of it. It's why they haven't been produced yet because uh, uh, they're, I can't, you know, I can't find the money for them, and I don't, I don't, and I'm, I'm past that stage now where I pay for my own shows. I, I've just done too much of that, and I'm tired of that. And so I'm, I just bide my time. I don't complain. I just sit back and let the rivers flow, and uh, and they will come in the fullness of time. As a friend of mine said, in the fullness of time, they're coming. And uh, even if I'm not here, they will still be playing. You know, they will be premiering after I'm gone. And that's the point. I don't have to be here. I don't have to be on stage receiving applause. That's not the reason. I'm just doing, trying to do the best work I can to make my people's lives as beautiful as possible. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, ultimately the, the, the ambition is, I am not an artist. I am a social, I'm still a social worker. It's just that I, it's just that I use art as a, as, a, as, a, as a tool for social change. And so uh, I, I write stuff with a social conscience. And so I believe that ultimately in order for a nation to be healthy, it has to have a spirit that is healthy. You know, to live with joy, uh, uh, to live with uh, joy and love is a secret to success, the secret to, a hap to happiness, to a joyful life. A lot of laughter is involved and, uh, and to live in the moment as well. That is the essence. Because if you start to live in the past, you start to become bitter. You start to become angry because a lot of ugly things have happened to our people in the past. And if you have to start from thinking about those, something you start thinking about something that happened 50 years ago, that is a surefire success for misery. You will just be miserable. And eventually you will work yourself into the ground, you know? You can't do that. You have to live in the moment and in the future. 
so that the future is glorious. I see a glorious future for us because that's all I see. That's all I choose to see. And I will help make it happen. But uh, those are the keys. Think, the, live in the moment, live today. You know, today is going to be a spectacular day. And that's all there is to it. And uh, so be able to, to be able to say that, you know, with that, with that, for a nation, for a people, not to have a healthy spirit is not, it's not good. It'll kill us, mm. you know? So the, it's, uh, the contrary is to, 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 for that spirit to be joyful, to be happy, to live in the moment, all those things. Uh, that's the key to success. That is the key to happiness. And that's where we want to, that's where we want to take them. So now we have a, a spiritual life, which is the arts. Okay, that's the, the, the arts is the definition of the spirit, the spirit of a people, of a civilization. So if we have that healthy spirit, we, are, we will be a, a healthier nation as time goes on. We still have a lot of problems. We still have an awful lot of work to do, but we're getting there, you know? Step, step by step, show by step, poem by poem, line by line. And that's all we can ask for, right? That's all we can ask for, yes. So when we last spoke uh, several years ago, you had mentioned that you were working on your autobiography or a fictionalized account covering 15 years uh, of your life, beginning, if I recall, with the words, I was born in paradise. Okay. How is that story going? Uh, it, it's I'm, I'm, it's right on my computer right there. Uh, it's uh, finished. Uh, it's almost finished. Uh, it'll be. It's coming out on September 28th this, this fall. Okay. It's called Permanent Astonishment, and this is I, I got this for a friend. Okay. I, this is a forward. <clears throat> I, I just put the forward in. I just inserted the forward into into the, uh, the uh, just after the title page, and it's coming out. It's just being edited. They're doing the final copy editing right now. At, the, at my publishers, and, and this is a forward, it's very short. This is a shaped shifter book, residing in the space between fact and fiction, the fantastical place of memory and dream. It is a book imagined and written in the head and in the heart in what is one of the most joyful and funniest languages on earth. And it's true, and that's the forward. Yeah, it was uh, written by somebody else, not me. Um, but I'm going to uh, edit, uh, uh, credit them in the in the book. Uh, but uh, and that's the other thing that's that's the joyful part of my life <clears throat> is that I was born in Cree. I I, I didn't speak English until later on uh, in life, and I still have to speak Cree in order to communicate with my people at home, the elders. When I go home to Broche, I speak. I refuse to speak English. I speak Cree. Everybody, I uh, even if they address me in English, I will answer in Cree. Uh, it is the funniest language in the world, it really is. It just really is the most, the first syllable in Cree and you start to laugh automatically. You really know that. And contrary wise, the first syllable you utter in English, you stop laughing. It really is the truth. And so, and there's reasons for that. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, very, very definite uh, sociological reasons for that, philosophical reasons, uh, theological reasons for that. But it has to do with, uh, the fact that if you look into our collective mythology or into our collective psychology, you will never find a story in there about eviction from a garden, you know, which is, the, which is what holds the English language together. Right? At one, God, who was male, first of all, gave, gave uh, the planet to mankind, which is womankind out of the picture, uh, and, and, and then kicked him out of the garden because of an act, an act of pleasure engaged in by a woman, okay? So it's her fault that we've been kicked from the garden, and uh, which is very sexist when you think about it. Um, so that story is unique only to a certain part of the world. It's a story that's unique to monotheism, which is the system of one God. Uh, in order to go beyond that, you have to go to other languages, other religions, other cosmologies, other mythologies, other systems of thought, and including uh, the predecessor to monotheism, of course, was polytheism, which is a system of many gods and goddesses. I'm talking about the Greeks and the Romans as well. And then beyond that, in the, in the, great, in the great sweep of human history, there was uh, pantheism, which is uh, uh, the system where nature, God, divinity, the uh, divine energy is in, is in everything. Nature sees with divine energy. The leaves, the leaves of trees, the blades of grass, rocks, they have a soul right? uh, in, in the structure of the, English, of the Cree language. Uh, and so you will never find, if you dig, no matter how dig deeply you dig into that, into that, that uh, 
the ground. You will never find a story in our mythology of eviction from a garden. For us, Canada is the most stunningly beautiful garden, garden there ever was. And it's our job to take care of it, you know, not to curse it. Uh, and that's the, the key to the joy of our language, that the lang language just came out of that cosmology. And, the, and those are the native North American languages, which is why they laugh so much. Uh, it's, we're here in a garden. This is a garden for us, you know, we weren't kicked out. Whereas the other one, uh, the English language, that's, that's a central, it, it's, the English language is, is that's a central uh, power that, that holds it down, is eviction from a garden. They are no longer in the garden. We're no longer allowed to laugh. We're here to be miserable and as miserable as possible. And the more miserable you are on this, in this life, the greater the joy there will be in heaven afterwards, if, you, if you've been good enough. Yeah? That whole thing. Uh, it's, it's a reverse for us. Now is the time to be joyful. You know, because there's no heaven. To us, heaven is right here. You are in heaven already. And you will, when you die, you don't go up there. You stay in the earth and you melt, your body melts and, and becomes a part of this, a, a part of this soil, a part of the, uh, the earth. And your, but your spirit lives on. It's still there. My brother who died, my younger brother, the dancer who passed away at age 35, I don't miss him. He's here all the time. He told me, the last thing he told me before he passed away was, don't mourn me, be joyful. And that's what I have to do. That's my job now. It's, that's why I'm so crazy. Uh, I have to, my responsibility now is to be joyful for not one, but two people. So I have to be doubly joyful. And so I don't miss him. He's here all the time with me in some form or other in, as, as an energy. I have, I have his voice, for instance, you know. Uh, I, have his, I have his ass. I have a really nice ass, for instance, you know. Are you sure you are Cree? So yeah, yeah, yes, I am. Anyway, and so on and so forth. You know, he's here. His joyful spirit is here, and I celebrate that joy all the time. I have no time in my life for negative energy, negative thoughts. If they come to me, I try to get rid of them as, as quickly as possible because my job here is to be joyful. My joy, my job here on this planet in a, in a few years that I have left is to give joy. Just give joy which is why every second word that comes out of my mouth is silly as all hell, because I want to make people laugh. Eh? Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, the other day, uh, I, and by the way, I don't speak English anymore. I speak French. I live in Quebec. My partner is, Quebec, uh, is French. And I've been, I live in France for 14 years, which is why it affects the language. Uh, and I, like, for example, just, uh, when I was at the store, je <laughs> and I can say and I, and I, you know, these days you're always lining up. It's always uh, social distancing, right? You have to keep three, two meters just apart in stores. You have to wait outside. And I don't it's like that here in Quebec. You go to the liquor store and you have to wait out. There's a lineup outside because they only allow so many people inside the store and you have to wear masks, of course, and all that sort of stuff. And so I was, I went into this bakery and I said, and uh, without realizing that there was one client at the counter doing his, as his staff, a man. And, uh, and, I, and then I went and stood behind him because I didn't realize that there was a woman in the corner like, uh, rifling through uh, some goods, some merchandise. And she tapped me on the shoulder gently. And basically she said, excuse me, this is my place. You know, I, I, I was here before you. She didn't say that, but basically I said that. And she was you know, a woman of a certain size, I, I could request. And I said to her, oh, pardon, madame. Je t'ai pas vu, je t'ai pas vu. Je t'ai pas vu, je t'ai pas vu. I said to her, which means, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. You're so thin. That, I, that you're almost invisible. <laughs> so, <laughs> she burst out laughing. <laughs> I just love your way. I hear laughter, hear laughter, you hear laughter. I have to hear it every day, otherwise I would just die. I, it's my favorite sign of the world. So I, I will do whatever I can in my energy to, to create it, to hear human mm -hmm. laughter. So Speaking I, of which. Full of jokes, I'm full of jokes. Speaking of joyfulness and laughter and your favorite sound, uh, the postmistress will be playing yes. at the Royal MTC. Tell me how you found this beautiful story. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, as I, I love the, how these things are created. Uh, when my brother passed away 30 years ago, he was 35, he would have been 65 this year. And my parents passed away uh, uh, 20 years ago, my mother and my, my mother, my father, about 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, that can't be, the mathematics don't work out. Yes, 88, my father died. My, my brother died in 1990 and my mother died in 1999. And, uh, and so those are the, the people closest to me who have gone on. 
to the to the other side, so to speak. Okay, so they come to me in my dreams. Uh, they visit me in my dreams regularly because they're so close to me. I call them my spirit guides. You know, I always think that before I had make to make a difficult decision, I think I think what would Joe Harry do? What would Joe Harry say here? And half the time, it's just if somebody if something makes you angry, you don't say. Oh, go fuck yourself. You don't talk like that. You know, you just don't, you avoid that kind of, that's abuse. Abuse, not only of the other person, but of your own spirit. So he would just, what he would do is just walk away. Just walk away in complete silence and not show a smidgen of anger or resentment. That's how he was. And so that's what I do. I just walk away. And uh, so the word F-U-C-K doesn't even exist in my language. I just don't use it. And the other word I don't use is H-A-T-E. I'm scared of that. That's bad, bad medicine. And uh, so these spirits come to me in my dreams. And so I, after a while, I started conceiving of the, that a human dream as a kind of a visiting chamber, a visiting room, uh, a, vis a, vis a visiting parlor where the dead and the living visit. And you have nice, these nice little chats in this, in this visiting room, right? And, uh, and then so uh, later on, I, I, I turned, so I started thinking of the human dream as a post office. Uh, a place where letters from the dead and the living cross, okay? The, the letters from the dead to the living and vice versa. And so that's where the postmistress came from. The postmistress is actually a goddess. And, and, and then I go into mytho world mythologies because that's, I really am fascinated by the way myth world mythologies function, specifically uh, native mythology, Christian mythology, and its predecessor Greek mythology, because the difference between those three mythologies or cosmologies, if you want to, if you want to put it that way, or theologies, it is a way, there is a place where those three, those three intellectual disciplines uh, cross over. But uh, the big difference between our like pantheism with, with the biological term for which is animism, pantheism is the theological term, uh, animism is the biological term, but it's the same thing. Nature is filled with animate energy. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the big difference between animism and monotheism is that mon in monotheism, in, in pantheism, nature is God. Nature is alive and, and, and filled with spirit. In monotheism, only, only, uh, there was only one God. Mono means one, uh, and he's male. So the idea of divinity in female form doesn't exist at all. It, it left Christianity a long time ago. And the Virgin Mary is not a goddess. She's a human, OK? <clears throat> That's the, that's the closest Christianity gets to uh, the idea of divinity in female form. And the predecessor to Christianity, which is Greek mythology, there were 12 gods and goddesses in the great pantheon, half of whom were gods, like Zeus and Mercury and uh, Poseidon, the god of the sea, and so on and so forth. And then the other half were women. My favorite one being Aphrodite, the goddess of sex. You know, uh, She is the goddess you see, you come face to face with at that moment in time when your body has reached its most joyful point. You know, something that is forbidden in, in Christianity. You know, you're never supposed to have that kind of sensation in Christianity. In Christianity, sex does not exist. Uh, joy is forbidden. And uh, so uh, I, I, I traveled past the Christ Christian monotheist, mon monotheistic thinking to its predecessor, which is polytheistic thinking, to a time in human history when uh, humanity had goddesses, and so I pick the, house, the God, the, the God, God the Father, whose name was Zeus in Greek mythology. He had a wife called Hera, the Mother Earth Goddess. Okay, and then his his, his uh, polar opposite was the God of the Underlife, the God of the Underworld, the God of Death. His name was Hades, and he had a wife too. Her name is Persephone, and she was the one who was responsible for going up to the earth for six months of the year, to the surface of the earth, which is summertime, and then going back down into the, the underworld, underground for the winter, Persephone. And so she inevitably she carried messages from one world to the other, right? And so in my play, the postmistress is Persephone, the goddess of the dead. And she's a postmistress. And that's where that, that, that play came from. But now I've ruined the, uh, the punchline because you're not supposed to know that. And the only, <laughs> the only Spoiler a, alert! <laughs> it comes uh, as a surprise at the end. That's what the place and those and the set and the song. There's twelve songs in the show. Yes, and beautiful music, beautiful. You, I remember getting the album and uh, just and listening to it over and over. It's a love letter from the dead to the living, and vice versa. Yeah. yeah, well, it's stunning, and I look forward to watching it as it hits the theaters here. Yeah. Thompson, 
in a hundred years from now, when people look back at your work, what do you hope that they see? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't think in those terms. I don't think, uh, somebody asked me that, how do you want to be remembered? This one interview asked me, and I said, and to tell you the truth, I don't want to be removed. <laughs> I don't want to be remembered. I'm not interested. It's not my problem. I won't be here. Uh, I guess maybe if you want to really press me, press me uh, uh, up against the wall with that question, I'd say he laughed a lot. He mm -hmm. laughed all the time. His philosophy, one, one of his many philosophies was, if you, if you haven't laughed 100 times today, you haven't lived that day. You know? But to be another, another, another philosophy of mine is, to, to live one moment without joy, uh, to, me, to, to live not moment, a moment without joy is a moment wasted. Mm -hmm. I believe that from the heart, of, from, the, from the core of my heart. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be, it's your job. It's your job as a human being to go out there and, and make people laugh. Even if you had to make a fool of yourself in front of 500 people, something got done. I'm not scared. I just wait for the laughter to die and just move on. Well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing these wonderful stories and memories with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. You, you look you look so neat on camera. You have such nice teeth. There you go. <laughs> Brought to you by Indian Affairs, but yeah, that's another story. Sense of nine toothpaste. Anyway, uh, anyway uh, yeah. It's it's too bad I couldn't speak to you because it's the most hysterical language. I just do, I'll just do, I, I had a problem, I do, I, I write in Cree. <coughs> so I always have problems uh, translating into English. <coughs> so yeah. I was saying, and then Jesus died. So when Jesus died on the cross, the night before he died on the cross, he spoke to his father and said, Father, why are you doing this to me? In the Garden of Gethsemane, right? <coughs> he was there, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane because he was broke. Because that's, you, you get it, get some money. <laughs> He had, he had gone to the West Bank to get some money, but the bank was closed. So he went to the garden and get some money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, uh, and so in my, in my sentences, I say, the night, and the night before he died by fork. I said, he didn't die on the cross. But in the white man version, Jesus died on a cross, which is not a very funny story. It's a tragic story. In, my, in the Cree version, he died by fork, which is a very funny story. Because how you translate crucifixion into Cree is et das kwaji, which is funny automatically. It's just a funny, funny word. Yeah, et das kwaji, that means in French. Uh, it means uh, to, be, to be pierced. Jesus was pierced with a fork. That's how he died. <laughs> you laugh. It's a funny story. <laughs> but you don't understand. The second you translate that to English, it's, oh, he, he got crucified. <laughs> Different ending entirely. And it, and it goes, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. My God, I had to, oh, I can't even go there because English is not allowed to go in certain places on the human body. Eh? It's just not allowed to have a good mm. time. Mm. You know? yeah, pleasure is forbidden, and that's not good. Pleasure, the the amount of pleasure, come on, just an idea. The absence of pleasure is uh, makes a human being very sad, very, a, very, a very happy person. Well, with that, I thank you again for your time. Thank you. And I hope again, we can talk real soon. Uh, in person, because I can't stand this, uh, this electronic communication, right? I it's, agree. Uh, you know, the thing I miss most about this pandemic is to hug. I love to hug and I haven't been able to hug anybody. Oh, except my partner. But, <laughs> My grandchildren, who are nine, nine and seven, mm -hmm. my grandchildren, I haven't been able to hug them for like, whoa, a long time. We had to like stand two meters apart and crack, crack jokes. Yeah. My favorite, my, I, I collect knock knock jokes for them, and they're French. They're, we are, they have to be very, well, they speak English too, but they're being raised in French. Okay, I'll tell you. Knock knock, who's there? Who? Quiche. 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 Okay, quiche. Quiche who? Tease me, darling. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> okay. Okay. I actually behave myself. I can't believe it.
Thank you, Thompson. It's always an adventure speaking with you. And thank you out there for, for joining us for our In Conversation today. Thompson's play, The Postmistress, runs from April 8th to the 25th right here at the Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre. Make sure you come back and visit the bridge again tomorrow when From Script to Stage Panel takes place at 10 a.m. Central. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, I would say. <laughs>